That still leaves them six million to go, but this is Russia's last generation. Mm-hmm. So even if the Russians do manage to overwhelm Ukraine this year and start and start what will turn into the greatest genocide uh, since World War II, um, this is going to take a lot of men, and this is the last conventional war that the Russians will be capable of fighting. Uh, the second book is about the three big conflicts of the era that we're in now, and the Ukraine war is just the first one. We've got we've got two more brewing: one in the Middle East between the the Persians and the Saudis, and another one uh, in the east uh, eastern rim of Asia, most likely involving the Chinese and the Japanese. Whether it's because of the Japanese throwing a hail mary, I'm sorry, whether it's because of the Chinese throwing a hail mary or the the war that follows the Chinese disintegration. Uh, you know, there's going to be a slug match out there. Well, I don't know if you'd heard this, but the Americans are sick of it, uh, so we've left. Uh, we we can all have conversations about whether we could have left more cleanly, and that's legitimate. But oh my God, we're out! And if we hadn't been out, then what's going on in Ukraine would be much more difficult, if not impossible. Uh, and we would not have the political and military bandwidth to do other things. The American withdrawal, you know, Biden got a lot of crap, but you know, Trump didn't want to pull out because he didn't want to deal with the day of the pullout. Same with Obama. Uh, uh, so we've left. Uh, we we can all have conversations about whether we could have left more cleanly, and that's legitimate. But oh my God, we're out! And if we hadn't been out, then what's going on in Ukraine would be much more difficult, if not impossible. Biden got a lot of crap, but you know, Trump didn't want to pull out because he didn't want to deal with the day of the pullout. Same with Obama. Uh, so this this is a scab that we needed to rip off, and we can argue about how if could we have done it better, and maybe, but. We always knew the Afghan government was going to collapse shortly after we left. Now, we didn't think it was going to be the second after we left. We thought they might last a year. No one thought it was going to last two. Yeah. So I don't think it's going to pull us back in. I mean, the TBD, but uh, the pullout is pretty much complete. We've got a couple hundred special forces running around Syria. Their time is limited. And as soon as they're gone, there is no reason to consider uh, that the CENTCOM base in Gutter needs to be there anymore because it's not doing anything. It, it should be back in the United States. Uh, the last big thing that they did was do security briefs for the World Cup. And I'm sorry, that is not worthy <laughs> of CENTCOM's attention. Uh, so we don't even have carriers that are in the Gulf regular anymore because we are now completely energy independent again. Uh, and we are the world's largest re- exporter of refined products. So the energy argument for being involved is no longer there. Mm. Uh in this sort of environment, the Iranians have done wonders in leveraging the American position to rile up sectarian groups throughout the region to overthrow governments and ge- cause general chaos. That has generated a, an ongoing backlash with the Saudis now in the fray because they realize the Americans aren't going to fight their wars for them. But whereas the Iranians ultimately want to use these minority groups to get control, the Saudis don't care about what it looks like so long as the Iranians lose. So they have been willing to use terror groups and militant groups to just burn down everything to its foundation. Uh, The two scenarios to consider, uh, number one is a straight up slugfest between the two powers that put half of all maritime transported oil and the crosshairs in between them. Mm. That'd be bad. Option two is the two of them basically engage in rising proxy conflicts that destroy every country in Mesopotamia, Mm. uh, most notably Iraq. No matter how that goes down, uh, you you get a big hit to energy supplies and the country that is at the very end of the energy kick chain is China and they're the ones who will have to suck up the majority of the loss. They are. uh, The problem with well, the problem with natural gas is you can't redirect it at all. You have to have specialized shipment systems, and if the pipes aren't there, it just goes offline. And that is the case that we're seeing with natural gas. Oil is a little bit more flexible because it's a liquid, um, but the time it would take to build infrastructure from the Western Siberian fields that used to supply the Europeans okay. to the coast of China, you know, that, that's a 15, 20 year project that cost over a hundred billion dollars. Wow. We're talking China, we're talking Russia. These are countries not intimidated by the concept of scale, but you don't do that fast. Yeah. So what we're seeing is tankers taking crude from the Baltic and the Black Sea ports, going West at some point, either in the Atlantic or the Mediterranean, uh, taking these small shuttle tankers and reloading them onto super tankers, and then sailing around Africa and India and Vietnam to get to China. And the volume that is going that way is about a million, maybe a million and a half barrels a day, with another roughly million going to India. Okay. A uh, couple problems here. 
Number one is insurance, and you know, don't get bored. This this will be quick <laughs> and it's interesting. Uh, every reinsurance company in the world has said they will no co- longer cover any Russian cargo. So the only companies that will insure it are state companies from India and China who have never insured anything before. And so the first time we have an incident where we have an insurance payout, it's going to go directly into international arbitration, and that will take years. And at that point, uh, no one will want to get an Indian or Chinese insurance policy anymore. Wow. Uh, Russian pressure will build up in the pipes from the export point all the way back to the fields. Mm. And most of this crude comes from the permafrost. And if for whatever reason the pressure backs up to the well, the well uh, will seal shut because the oil will coagulate into a gel and the water that comes up as a byproduct will freeze into water and the water when water freezes into ice it it expands and it pops the wells from the inside okay. and, and that's all she wrote and we lose three four million barrels a day of russian crude so not only are the chinese now getting oil from twice as far away as they normally did which was already the most risky energy transport route in the, in the, in in history uh, they're now getting it from a supply system that is eminently unstable and it is going to break down sooner or later. And they're still picking a fight with the United States, which controls the security of this route. So it doesn't matter really at this point which piece of the system breaks. The Chinese are the ones that lose all of it. When I say Hail Mary, it's not that I think they can win. But one of the things to remember about the Ukraine war is that the Russians get what they're after, which is a more securable uh, exterior crustal defense. They actually do buy themselves some buy, buy themselves some more time. Mm-hmm. There's nowhere that the Chinese can conquer that buys them time. So the only reason that the Chinese would launch a war uh, is to try to preemptively remove Japan and Ukraine and uh, Japan and Taiwan from the equation, maybe Vietnam too, or if they're like me and they believe that they're facing economic and agricultural and financial and political and demographic breakdown, and they know that the end is nigh anyway, Mm. picking the time and the place of the fight so that at home you can write the narrative of the national defeat, that might be enough for the CCP to retain control as the country collapses. Maybe. So, you know, basically fight a war and for the low, low price of 500 million dead countrymen, you're still in charge. (sighs) That they're still there. I mean, I I was probably among the most optimistic people for the Ukrainians uh, because they have done a lot in the last eight years since the Donbass war to build up a military and establish a sense of identity and politically unify the country. They made some real gains. But I don't even even I didn't think they were going to last a year, much less all of a sudden. It's I don't want to call it a peer conflict. It's not. But, you know, be in the same class. Uh, This should not have happened. The Ukrainians have overperformed by every possible measure. The Europeans have stepped up to the plate in a way that I didn't think they were capable of. Mm. The Americans have joined in, and I thought with European feckleness um, and general disinterest from Obama and Trump and Biden that we wouldn't get involved. And then, of course, most of all, the Russians have just proven to plumb the depths uh, and the frontiers of incompetence in every possible military field. Uh, It took that combination of things for Ukraine to still be in the game. I hope it continues. Um, But this is still Russia's war to lose. No, there there have been eight negotiated settlements with the Russians, and they just wait a few months to a year or two, and then they push on. It gives the Russians time to consolidate and move on. Remember that when when the Soviet system existed, they controlled every one of the access points to the Eurasian plain where the, where the Russian heartlands are. It was the most secure that the Russians had ever been. They had spent 350 years building that exterior mm. position, and they finally got it in 1945. Uh, 1992, they lost all but one of those access points. And everything that Moscow has done, not just Putin, everything that Moscow has done since 1992 has been about rebuilding that crustal defense. Mm. So this is the Karabakh War Settlements. This is the Georgia War, the Abkhaz War, the, the the Kazakh intervention, the Donbass War, the Crimea War. All of these are part of the same chapter of Russian history. And so if there was a negotiated settlement, they would grab the territory, they would reinforce it, they would consolidate it. And then as soon as they felt they were ready, they would launch another conflict, just like they did the last eight times. Um, yes, uh, they thought that they could get Ukraine all in one go, and they thought to a degree like I did back in January that the Europeans and the Americans were not going to stick up for Ukraine. Mm. And I, just like they, 
miscalculated. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if there was a time to stop the Russians from this process and try to force them into negotiations over a non-Soviet future in which we all you know, get along, if that's the right phrase, the time was 2004, because that was when the Russians invaded Georgia. And Georgia was a country that was attempting to westernize, attempting to get rid of corruption, attempting to join the EU. And because we were involved in Iraq, we had absolutely no diplomatic and especially military bandwidth. So yeah. the Russians invaded Georgia while Putin was in a box at the Olympics with George Bush to underline that there was nothing that he could do. You know, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been four years now since we did the, the withdrawal from Iraq. And so we now have an army that is rested and recouped and has had a chance to retrain and re-equip and, uh, and build out its numbers again. It's capable. I don't think anybody in the military doubts that. But political support in the United States for any sort of ground war, that's going to take another decade. And that's not going to be in Ukraine. No, no, I'm not. Unless something significant shifts in the strategic picture. So if Ukraine collapses this year, uh, we will have forces in Poland and we will be at a very high risk of a nuclear exchange with the Russians. That's one of the reasons why we're trying so hard to support the Ukrainians so that that doesn't happen. That we aren't put into that position. Because there's no there's no buffer anymore. Uh, no yeah. buffer states. Uh, and, and we now know that the Russians are so militarily incompetent that in a face to face fight with NATO, they would be obliterated. And so the only tool that they would have are nukes. And the Russians feel rightly that if they can't get to that crystal defense again, their demographic decline is so steep that they'll cease to exist in 20 years. And they're right. Mm -hmm. So for the yes. Russians, they're all in. And that means every tool is on the table. Yeah. There are two types of AI. You've got applied AI, which is what we use in, say, automation and programming, where you have a very complex decision tree. And if anything falls out of that decision tree, the whole thing uh, falls apart. So that's a programming issue. That's um, applied mechanics, applied intelligence, if you want to call it that. But it's really more accurately thought of as machine learning. Okay. And it requires a lot of people. One of the reasons the Chinese are pretty decent at this space is they have a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so when you throw a lot of folks who earn only fifteen to $20,000 a year at a problem like this, you can do a lot of programming.